Hello everyone, this is Alex the Real Mr. Robinson and welcome to the very first episode of what is being called at the moment the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. Um, it might keep that name, but at the moment that's what it's being called. Maybe it'll be a permanent name, who knows. But anyway, a little background for what this is. This is the first episode of basically my movie news podcast. I really have wanted to get back into doing podcasts for a while, or at least my own. I've appeared on the Geeked Out Nation show many, many times. But, um, well, because I'm a regular on there. But I really wanted to start doing my own shows again. With Rooftop Chats, my casual podcast where we talk about anything and everything going on around the world, I feel like that podcast works best when I'm playing off of someone, and um, I've just been busy, and Catherine Diaz has been out of town, so we haven't been able to film any stuff or record any stuff, but um, she'll be back, and when she does, um, we'll get that show back underway, but I figured, you know what, I'll just start up a movie podcast right now and have it be by myself. Maybe someday in the future, I'll have a guest on board, but at the moment, I think it's just going to be a podcast where I talk about at least five news stories that caught my attention the past week. Um, so without further ado, oh, one more thing I'll say before we get things started. I'm Since I'm getting back into the groove, there might be a few points where I glitch up. Not, not in terms of audio, but in terms of me speaking or trying to collect my thoughts. Like, I'm not a John Campia where I, like, know everything that's going on in the industry. Like, I have to think about my opinions for a while, or sometimes I have thoughts while recording. So, um, we're basically just going to get this underway. So, enjoy this intro music, and we'll be right back. All right, I'm back, and again, welcome to episode one of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show, and this is for May 15th of 2016. It's probably important that I list the dates for these episodes. But anyway, with that long introduction out of the way, we are going to get into the news. We're going to start off with um, the fact that Gareth Edwards has dropped out of Godzilla 2. This story comes from Deadline, where they say, quote, Gareth Edwards has exited Godzilla 2. I'm told that the split was an agreeable one for Legendary, Warner Brothers, and Edwards, who helmed the first series into... Blah, who helmed the first series... Blah, 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 take two. Who helmed the first film in the series in 2014 and signed on to direct Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which looks from the trailer like it'll be a strong next step in the franchise. Huh? Close quote, huh? The reason they say he's dropping out is because he wants to move on to do smaller movies rather than do Godzilla, do Star Wars, then go right back to doing Godzilla, even though Godzilla's been delayed um, to 2019. And that's, I can understand that. And the agreement, and apparently the split was also an agreement between uh, all parties, Legendary Warner Brothers and Gareth Edwards. Um, and then the article also says, quote, Legendary and Warner Brothers are looking for a director to replace Edwards as they also work on Godzilla vs. Kong, which has been set for release on May 20th, 2020. The latter film was made possible with Kong Skull Island was brought back from Universal to Warner Brothers where Legendary made Godzilla. Legendary acquired rights to additional classic characters from Toho's Godzilla universe, including Rodan, Mothra, and King Ghidorah. So, here are my thoughts on um, Gareth Edwards dropping out of Godzilla. As somebody who really likes the first Godzilla movie that he made, this story doesn't really bother me that much. Here's why. When Godzilla came out two years ago, one of the things that Gareth Edwards decided to do was restrain Godzilla, hold him back, keep him, like, as a surprise, tease us. And sometimes it got a little too much like I wish he'd stop it but most of the time I thought it worked out really well the reason is because 
this is a new introduction to Godzilla, and it was a new way of telling a Godzilla movie that we haven't seen in any of the Japanese films, at least since the first one in 1954. But a lot of people didn't really like it that much. So if he was going to do this same technique with the sequel, and especially with Rodan Mothra and King Ghidorah thrown into the mix, then that's the point where I'd not give him a pass. I'm like, okay, you're doing it again. We need more Godzilla in the sequels, not less. But the real question is, who would direct the sequel? At the moment, I can't say. I don't really have any idea of who would direct the sequel and make it a Godzilla movie that everyone can agree it's awesome. Excuse me. Because every Godzilla movie that has come out in America or made by an American studio has been polarizing to an extent. The first Godzilla movie from 1998, the first American one, is an abomination of mankind because it strayed so far away from the source material that um, it just wasn't Godzilla at all. Like it pissed off fans because of that, me included. And even if you like remove the name Godzilla, it's not even a good movie for what it's trying to be. It's more tolerable uh, if you take the name Godzilla away, but it's still very, very bad. And then with the 2014 movie, it was much more faithful to the original Godzilla, and I would even clarify it as the first American Godzilla because, again, the Roland Emmerich one strayed so far from the source material that if you like it, that's fine, I guess, but just don't call it Godzilla. It's not a Godzilla movie. Oh, shit. All right, there was some squirrel jumping around outside. <laughs> Scared the fuck out of me. Um, but my point is... I don't want a Godzilla movie that's going to polarize audiences <clears throat> because the 2014 movie, while many fans liked it because it was faithful to Godzilla, there were a other handful of fans and general audience members that didn't like the fact that Godzilla wasn't in the movie that often, which, I mean, okay, I think it's not completely fair to say that because a lot of the Godzilla movies had Godzilla didn't have Godzilla in it that often. Uh, there were a few that were very much like what the American version did. And I feel like the, and and plus it's not like you're not getting monster action because you still have the Muto. And I feel like um with the way Godzilla 2014 was structured, it felt like a remake of Gamera Guardian of the Universe where the main focus of the movie was on the two villain monsters. Uh, in Gamera, it was Gauss. In Godzilla, it was Muto. And then the title monster like popped up every now and then to do awesome things. So I would not be surprised if Gareth Edwards um, actually drew inspiration from Gamera, Guardian of the Universe. So those are my thoughts on Gareth Edwards exiting Godzilla 2. Um, I'm fine with it, but um, I hope who they get to direct... Uh, this next movie is also a big fan and um, really understands the character and gives us more Godzilla, but will also make the human characters more interesting. But to be honest, at the moment, the only Godzilla thing I'm looking forward to is Godzilla Resurgence. So until Godzilla Resurgence comes out, my priorities are not on Godzilla 2. All right, well, let's move on to... Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Most notably, let's move on to that Black Panther movie that's coming out. Over the w past week, we got some casting news. Um, obviously, Chadwick Boseman's going to come back as T'Challa, a.k.a. Black Panther. But uh, Nupita Nyong'o is also in talks for the movie, which I guess is confirmed now. Uh, because there's this story that I have from uh, US Weekly that says that in addition to Nupita Nyong'o and Chadwick Boseman, Michael B. Jordan will be in Black Panther also. Now, this is really cool because um, the movie's being directed by Ryan Coogler, who t directed Michael B. Jordan in Creed and F Fruitvale Station. So he's pretty much turning into Coogler's uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, where Martin Scorsese just uses Leonardo DiCaprio in so many things. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, if you have a good relationship, you keep it up. So, and according to U.S. Weekly, it says, quote, no details 
have been released about who Jordan will play, but one source tells The Hollywood Reporter that it could be a villain. Black Panther has been making headlines for being the first Marvel movie with a predominantly black cast. And the story with that is that Black Panther's cast, 90% of the cast will either be African or African American. And yeah, I think this is a great opportunity because Michael B. Jordan is a really good up-and-coming actor. Ryan Coogler is a really good director. I have not seen Fruitville Station, but Creed was fantastic, I gotta say. And Marvel hasn't done anything wrong yet. I mean, their worst movie was okay, and that was Thor The Dark World. I know a lot of people point to Iron Man 2, but I think Thor The Dark World is worse because the humor was just way too much. It almost felt like a Three Stooges episode at points, or it was just not there. But anyway, Marvel, I think, has been had a really good track record. And after uh, what we saw with Black Panther in Civil War, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to this movie. That and Spider-Man Homecoming. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with my guts on this one that Marvel hasn't really made a downright bad movie. Ryan Coogler has not made a bad movie yet. And I can't wait to see the finished product. Um, let's stay in the Marvel realm for a bit. Let's move on to... Okay, let's move on from Black Panther to Black Widow. Uh, um, I'm on the... Right now, I have this story from the uh, Weekly Catch-Up page on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, that um, Marvel's Kevin Feige is committed to doing a Black Widow movie. According to an interview, uh, um, there was a list of... Um, Basically, heroes that fans would like to see movies out of, like Falcon, Falcon, I'm sorry. If I talk about the Millennium Falcon, I have to say Falcon, but if anyone else, it's Falcon. Uh, Hawkeye and War Machine. But in, And to that, Kevin Feige replied, quote, Of the characters that you've just mentioned, I would say certainly that one creatively and emotionally that we are most committed to doing is Black Widow. Then Feige goes on to say um, that discussions were ongoing, so Marvel is not ready to confirm a Black Widow movie, but they are working on it. Uh, here's my opinion on the whole Black Widow movie, because this has been going around for a long time. I think ever since maybe the Avengers, or maybe it was Captain America Civil War, people have been demanding for a Black Widow movie. To that, I say we don't need a Black Widow movie. Here's why. With the movies that Black Widow's been in, um, the Avengers, Captain America the Winter Soldier, Avengers Age of Ultron, and Captain America Civil War, we got to know a lot about Black Widow just by those movies. And I think Black Widow works best as a supporting character. The reason I didn't mention Iron Man 2 is because she was just kind of there. Huh? She was like Wonder Woman in Batman vs. Superman where it was like, yeah, it's she's cool, but what was the point of her in that movie? But um, in those other movies that I mentioned, um, she got a lot of character development. We got to know a little more about her. It was basically everything that could be condensed into a Black Widow movie. So at this point, what would a Black Widow movie be about? Because in Age of Ultron, we saw um, how she kind of became the assassin she is. So I don't think a solo Black Widow movie would really offer much. And plus, this is, goes into um, <clears throat> something that I go by. Whatever um, works as a little supporting role doesn't always work as, like, the main thing. Uh? I mean, Black Widow could, probably. Uh? But, as I said, she works better as a supporting character. And usually, when you make a spinoff of a supporting character, I find the results are just not too good i mean we'll see what happens like i said marvel has yet to make a movie that i downright dislike but i think with black widow there are many more characters um that probably should get their own movie first i know captain marvel's coming so we're definitely gonna have a like female superhero movie and then also ant-man and the wasp is coming so we'll finally be able to see the character of wasp uh, properly and not just in flashback. So we'll see what happens with this one. Um, moving on, 
this is a story that, um, I mean, if you ever needed a good laugh for a day, if you're feeling down, just read a story um, where the t- headline is, Simon Kimberg wants a Fantastic Four sequel with the same cast. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get that laugh out. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, <laughs> this story comes from ComingSoon.net. Simon Kimberg, who is the writer for X-Men Days of Future Past, um, X-Men Apocalypse, and is the co-writer for stuff like um, Fantastic Four 2015 and X-Men The Last Stand, um, this guy's pretty much the um, Kevin Feige for Fox. Like It seems like he has his name on every Fox movie that comes out. So I guess he's the creative consultant behind it all. But um, anyway, uh, he said that he wants to do a sequel to last year's Fantastic Four movie, which if you saw last year's Fantastic Four movie, it sucked and it bombed hard. If you didn't see the Fantastic Four movie from last year, then Congratulations. Keep not seeing it. The quote from him, uh, this was an interview he did with Den of Geek. Uh, um, He says, quote, We want to make another Fantastic Four movie. We love that cast. Uh, I mean, if I were to say to you now, Michael B. Jordan and Miles Teller and Kate Mara and Jamie Bell are great actors, we love that cast. Uh, I love that comic. I mean, I love it almost as much as X-Men. We're working really hard on figuring that out. Nothing would make me happier than the world embracing a Fantastic Four movie. Oh, let me tell you, Kimberg, we would all love to embrace one. We'll try to be true to the essence of the Fantastic Four, which is completely, well, not completely, but largely distinct from X-Men, which is brighter, funner, and more optimistic. I think we tried to make a darker Fantastic Four movie, which seemed like a radical idea, but we were kind of messing with the DNA of the actual comic instead of trusting the DNA of the comic. Uh, Messing with the DNA is an understatement. You kind of mangled, tortured it, because that, let me tell you, that Fantastic Four movie was an abomination. I mean, there's two reasons why this movie should not happen. Um, Well, I mean, two reasons, but they all, like, join together. That movie sucked. It sucked hard. It made number one on my worst of lists um, last year because, it, like most of the time, it was just boring. Uh, none of the cast members um, fit the roles of fantastic. The fantastic, not none of the cast members fit the roles of their comic book counterparts, and that's not even anything about Michael B. Jordan being Johnny Storm. Like Ray. Like a black guy playing Johnny Storm, whatever. I don't. I don't care. Just as long as the actor does a good job. But nothing about that cast spoke Fantastic Four to me. Like I could never see Jamie Bell as Ben Grimm. I could never see Miles Teller as um, uh, Reed Richards. Like Michael B. Jordan, I could have seen as um, Johnny Storm. It's just they didn't do it very well. Which, um, by the way, going back into Black Panther for a second. I find it funny that both Chris Evans and Michael B. Jordan play Johnny Storm. Now they're both in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for redemption. So, uh, I know I'm, I'm stealing this from a meme, but uh, hey, actors, if you want to be in a Marvel movie, just go play the Human Torch. Uh, but anyway, nobody wants to see a sequel to a movie that's utterly despised. And on top of all that... Fox is not going to make a sequel to a movie that bombed hard. Fantastic Four cost $120 million. Domestically, it made $56.1 million. That is a flop right there. That is the definition of a bomb. And I know if you take the worldwide gross, both domestic and foreign, it made $167.9 million. It doesn't matter. It's still a flop. So... And it's just even more confusing why Fox would hang on to the Fantastic Four. Like, the only reason they do it is to spite Marvel. But seriously, what does the Fantastic Four do for Fox right now? Because they made three Fantastic Four movies. All of them sucked. Each one got worse and worse. With the one from last year being the worst of all. 
Just give it back to Marvel. You're never going to use the Fantastic Four again, Fox. As long as the Fantastic Four is under your control, nobody's going to embrace it because you already had three strikes. You're out, buddy. And plus, what we saw Marvel do with the Hulk, Daredevil, and Spider-Man, we know they can do Fantastic Four well, because after Ang Lee's Hulk, Universal did the Incredible Hulk, which got the character right, and then the Avengers, they perfected the Hulk. Um, Daredevil on Netflix, um, after the Ben Affleck movie from 2003, I believe, um, Fox... Marvel got Daredevil back, turned into a Netflix series, and it was totally awesome. It, they did the character justice. And then, um, even though Spider-Man has been well done in Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, and to an extent, Spider-Man 3, uh, Sony really had their claws all over the Amazing Spider-Man series. And um, after what we saw Marvel do with Spider-Man in Captain America Civil War, even if it was for a little bit... Uh, they made the perfect Spider-Man, so we know when given the Fantastic Four, they'll do justice. But the problem is, I think because the last movie sucked so hard, um, nobody wants to see a Fantastic Four movie for 10 years. It's just like when I uh, rewatch The Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones. Um, it's like, I don't need to see these movies for another 10 years. These are so bad. So, I don't know, like... On a business angle, it would be idiotic to make a sequel to a movie that was not financially successful. It's like with Atlas Shrugged, the movies. The first one made everyone's top ten list of worst movies and made no money. So, logically, or sarcasm, they decided to make a sequel, which I think uh, cost more money and probably bombed even harder to the point where the third movie just kind of, like, came and went. Like, nobody even knew. I, I doubt people even know that the third Atlas Shrugged movie exists. But, I mean, if you ha if you do know about it before the listening to the show, then comment uh, below and let me know because I'd be surprised. Huh? Well, yeah, Fantastic Four sequel, uh, it's a stupid idea. You'll lose more money if you do it with the same cast. Huh? Um, okay, well, let's move on to another news story. Um, let's move over to DC, which... Man, DC, I really want to do well with their movies, but... You all know my thoughts on Batman v Superman. Um, but what about Justice League? Well, there have been rumors going around that, um... The Justice League villain could be Darkseid, which is basically DC's Thanos, <laughs> But then reports this week say that the villain could be Steppenwolf, which I have no idea who Steppenwolf is. I'm not as immersed into DC as I am Marvel. Anyway, this story comes from comicbook.com. Uh, um, apparently, an early portion of the film will detail a battle which took place centuries ago when Darkseid was turned back by Amazons. Atlanteans and mankind. This battle was the setup. This battle will be the setup for the two Justice League films, as Steppenwolf and presumably later Darkseid is on Earth in search of the three mother boxes Darkseid left behind. Uh, what are the three mother boxes? Those three mother boxes, according to the report, are the three you see a character. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how this word it. Anyway. Are the three you see a character rumored to be Steppenwolf ma manipulating them in the homecoming deleted scene from Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which was released shortly after the film came to theaters? And I'm still quoting comicbook.com here. Of course, we don't know much about the whereabouts of the Mother Boxes other than that we saw one of them used to save the life of a dying teenager who will later turn out to be this, to later turn out to be Cyborg in the Star Lab security footage Batman and Wonder Woman viewed in Batman vs. Superman. A good bet would be that each of the three Earthborn races that fought Darkseid got one of the Mother Boxes and that both the Amazons and the Atlanteans have access to one of the others. Huh? Here's my concern here. Batman v. Superman had the big problem of cramming 
so much shit in it that only comic book fans are going to recognize. Mainstream audience members who are not familiar with the extended DC lore are not going to recognize this this stuff because when I saw um, uh, Batman v Superman, I didn't get the whole Mad Max Batman dream sequence. Huh? I didn't get uh, the whole thing where the dude comes out of the um, little lightning portal and tells Bruce about Lois Lane. Huh? It wasn't until much later where I was told that was the Flash. I'm like, didn't look a thing like the Flash. Huh? Um, and it's something that only uh, comic book fans are going to recognize. Huh? And the thing is, DC is trying, trying. They're really trying to catch up with Marvel so bad huh? um, that they don't earn everything that comes to them. They don't slowly introduce things. They just grab a big box of goodies, shove it down our mouths. Huh? And hope that we accept it. I'm like, no, I don't accept it because you're not building up to it. You're just dropping things and expect us to take it. Because with I okay, I always hate doing the whole Marvel versus DC thing, but I'm gonna do it. What Marvel has been doing with the Avengers, like go back to Phase One, they introduced every key character in the solo movies, Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, and Captain America. They made the villain of the first Avengers, Loki, and the reason for doing that was so they could have a reason for Thor to be in the Avengers. Like, uh, they gave a, had a reason for Thor to come down to Earth uh, and deal with this conflict. And then when they introduced Thanos, it was at the end of the credits, once the story was wrapped up, or the mid-credits. Um, you imagine Thanos eating shawarma <laughs> at the end credit scene, but anyway, that like was pretty much self-contained. Um, and then the next time we saw Thanos, and general audiences knew Thanos's name was in Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, where he was played by Josh Brolin. Uh, Josh Brolin. I don't know what I said. So basically, everything that Marvel does, they've earned their way towards. Like they've earned their way to a uh, civil war. They've, they're going to earn their way to the Infinity War. DC is not doing that. They are really shoving everything they can to catch up with Marvel. And Darkseid should not be the first villain um, that the Justice League faces. And I, again, I don't know who Stefan Wolf is. But um, to go to that homecoming scene... Okay, if you... Follow the Movie Backlot podcast, which is Geeked Out Nation's podcast. Uh, um, Stephen Merced, the creator of Geeked Out Nation, myself and uh, Dylan of the Apple Cow Prodigy YouTube page, uh, we're talking about Batman v Superman and how we were arguing about they cram too much stuff in to the point where the movie becomes bloated and hard to understand. Uh, Stephen Merced, um, once that deleted scene was released in, from Batman v Superman... Uh, he was like, okay, why didn't they put that scene in the movie? That would explain Lex Luthor's motivations even further. And as someone who's not familiar with comics, I had I have to say this. That doesn't explain anything to me. Huh? Like, it's just some dude in a weird alien chamber and a piss tool. Piss, piss tool. Take two. Piss pool. I don't get what that means. Like, what does it mean? Like, at least, again, with Marvel, like... They drop little things. They drop tiny things, and they'll always go back to um, sol like showing exactly what it is to those who are not familiar with it. Like again, the Infinity Stones. Um, we were teased that we were teased that the Tesseract and the Ether were Infinity Stones at the end of Thor: The Dark World, and then um, we got a and then mainstream audiences got a further taste of what the Infinity Stones are in Guardians of the Galaxy. So again, I. No, I. It's, this is a tough situation to be in because I would really love to see a really good DC movie. I want to see a really good Justice League movie, but after Batman v Superman, it's not going to happen. Because huh? Zack Snyder's still at the helm. DC is still cramming things right there. And plus, by putting Darkseid in the movie, it limits the possibility of um, future Justice League movies. Like, like they don't have. 
they just want to like really get to dark side immediately when you got to work your way up to that. That's the problem with Doomsday in Batman v Superman outside of the fact that he looks like total garbage is that you did the Superman death story two movies in. So now when Superman dies again, it's not going to matter because he died once before and they're not going to kill him again. So I don't know. Um, we'll move on. Um, we'll see what happens with this. I'm not enthusiastic about the DC Extended Universe. I, I hope for the best. I hope Wonder Woman's good. Uh, uh, Suicide Squad, I actually don't... I'm actually not as enthusiastic about Suicide Squad as many other people, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so let's move on to a trailer. Let's move on to the Assassin's Creed trailer, which stars... Um, Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard. Um, I am not too familiar with the Assassin's Creed series. I mean, I was actually at a friend's house like around the time the first game came out, uh, and he showed it to me, and um, it looked really cool. It looked like a game that I wanted to play. Uh. It looked very intriguing. Unfortunately, um, with in terms of movies. Uh, Video game movies have not been good at all. Um, the best one may have been Mortal Kombat, which even then, that's not saying much. It's still a bad movie. <clears throat> but with Assassin's Creed, okay, we have Assassin's Creed, Warcraft, and Angry Birds this year alone. I don't know so much about Warcraft. Like, Warcraft, I don't think has the potential to be very good. Like, it might flop. Um, Angry Birds is getting... Review good reviews. It's it's hard to say, especially from a little game that I shouldn't think could be a movie at all. But um, Assassin's Creed. I'm again. I'm not too familiar with um the games, but it does look um like the games. I mean, basically, okay. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, Assassin's Creed is sort of like a time travel science fiction game where you go back in time um, to events that deal with uh, the ancestors of the character you're playing as. I think. Don't hold that against me. And you could feel free to comment below and tell me what the actual games are about. So, I mean, the trailer, outside of the fact that they use Kanye West music, looks pretty good. Like, the action seems well choreographed. It has really good cinematography to it, I think. Uh, and obviously, Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard are really great actors. The only thing that's making me hesitant is the fact that we don't have a good video game movie out there. Could this be the one? Hard to tell. It comes out at the end of uh, 2016, I think December. So we'll wait and see what happens. But um, as of now, I'm not holding my breath. Huh? If Angry Birds is good or Warcraft's good, then maybe I'll have more faith in Assassin's Creed. But at the moment, there is no video game movie out there that can prove to me that Assassin's Creed is probably going to be good. Because, again, no video game movie is good. But anyway, that does it for the news. Um, now, let's move on to... Um, just really briefly, I'll mention the Blu-rays that are coming out this week. I do this on the Geek Down Nation show, and um, before you accuse me of like ripping off that idea, it was a suggestion that I made that we list off the Blu-rays at the end of every show. So I can't steal my own idea. Um, but anyway, um, this week there's not much to say. It's a very light... Um, load <laughs> load um we have the witch uh which came out this year even though it says 2015 whatever people have been talking about it i haven't seen it myself i'd like to but um I mean, we also have dark passage one of the many movies starring humphrey bogart and lauren bacall they were two of the most iconic actors in the 40s uh, during the old hollywood era um I've never seen this one. I've seen a couple of their movies together, and they really work well together. Uh, the Naked Island from the Criterion Collection from 1960. No idea what that was. Dirty Grandpa in the vein of Robert De Niro humiliating himself in very, very low-rate comedies, especially ones where at movie theaters they give you condoms. So there's that. Haven't seen it. And that does it, really. There's nothing else worth mentioning, uh, 
Um, but anywho, that's the first episode of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to hear your feedback on the show. Give me suggestions on how to improve the show. Um, and as always, you can uh, like, comment, subscribe, share with your friends. Let me know also about your thoughts on these news stories that I brought up. Huh? Um, don't forget to check out my official website. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, and Rift.tv. This will obviously be up on YouTube, and I did not mention SoundCloud because I'm going to be closing my SoundCloud account, which means anything that's on SoundCloud that's not on YouTube will eventually go to YouTube, like the um, ridiculous sex commentary, which I wish I'd known about uh, Rift.tv before doing that commentary because that would have been so much better. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this show. I look forward to doing this every week. And remember, this is the real Mr. Robinson telling you there is only one.